won't rock us too hard owning Ruckus AP devices, which will be, I think, one of the more hardcore hacking talks as we like it here at the Congress. Please give our speaker, Gail, a warm round of applause. Thank you. Um, right. Just one minute, and I'll be good to go. Uh, where is that? Awesome. Okay, so uh, I'm doing a live uh, demo, so I need to just be prepared with some stuff with a terminal here. This is always good. And another one, why not? And, uh, okay. Wait, what the, come on. Almost got it. Right, yeah, now I am almost good to go. Awesome. Well, thank you, and thanks CCC for inviting me to speak here. Uh, before I begin, I would, last, I would like to ask if anybody is familiar with Rockus uh, network devices. Raise your hand. All right, okay, all right. Well, CCC is going to hate me for the next slide. But uh, the first time I saw Ruckus access point was when I attended uh, Black Hat USA this year. I noticed that Ruckus provide the conference Wi-Fi. And when I got back home, I was wondering how many vulnerabilities were discovered on Ruckus equipment. So I did a quick research on cvdetails.com. And uh, I saw that Ruckus had 11 CVEs and five of them were critical. Those CVE were post-authenticated command injection. Well, um, this means no pre-auth RCE were found on Rockus devices and um, only post-auth authentication. So that either means that they are really, really secure or I'll let you answer this question yourself. So uh, wait, um, before I begin, uh, who am I? My name is Gaz Rohr. I'm from Tel Aviv, Israel. I'm a research leader at Aleph Research by HCL AppScan. And I've been doing reversing for around 10 years. And I focus on offensive and embedded devices research. And in this talk, I will be using this Ruckus R510 Unleashed. Ruckus has an Unleashed version for every access point they provide. Unleash our access points that don't rely on Wi-Fi controllers. However, all access points on this list share the same vulnerable code base. And I noticed that some vulnerabilities uh, also work on Zone Director product line, which is their Wi-Fi controller. The vulnerabilities I will show affect this firmware version and prayer. Firmware analysis was pretty much straightforward, no compression, no encryption, and on the R510, you can even get the kernel B config from some odd vision. Well, another cool thing about this research is that I did this entire research with device emulation. Only when I actually found a vulnerability, I actually bought a device. Now I would like to talk about my device emulation environment. I'm using my simple yet useful emulation dockers. On my Docker Hub, I got uh, pre-built QMU systems for different architecture, such as ARMv7, ARMv6, MIPS, and MIPS cell. And these dockers really help me emulating and setting up different routers. For this research, I used a docker that wraps an ARMv7 QMU that runs Debian kernel. And uh, now I would like to show you how easy it is to set up uh, an environment. Uh, and that, of course, does not work. So let me just, uh, hmm, um, just a minute. Um, OK. Um, so just a few more minutes, and I'll show the video. OK, got it. Oops. Awesome. OK, so here, um, so here I'm just uh, starting my uh, Docker. 
with uh, port 5575. And I am, uh, yeah, I'm going to first forward a bit because it's not the edit one. And here it just starts up. It takes uh, a few minutes. So uh, I cut it out from the original video. I'll just, all right. Uh, now I'm going to uh, go to the uh, firmware extraction folder and just start the SquashFS root system. And now I can just copy it using uh, SCP to the port that Docker uh, mapped to. And now I just tar it and then SSH to the Docker. And uh, I got the uh, tar GZ file. I'm going to extract it, get into the folder, sorry, get into the folder, and just use truth to change my root to this squashFS in any minute. Yeah. All right. So now I'm uh, running truth, change my root. And now I got the Rockus banner and the BusyBox, the Rockus BusyBox, and I can see the uh, init uh, D scripts, which are the startup scripts. OK. This is it for the Dockers. And let's start with uh, some exploits. So this is my first RCE. In this attack, I will fetch admin credentials without authentication and then pop a BusyBox shell with jailbreak through SSH. And let's start with the live demos, because demos are fun, and what could possibly go wrong, right? Just about everything, but yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, for this, I got my terminal, and uh, awesome. Let me just do uh, this. Um, OK, great. So now I'm going to uh, fetch a file from the router. So um, I'm just using wget. And this is my router uh, IP address, the one here. And I'm fetching a file from slash user slash wps tool. Oh, shit. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, Live demos, right? Yeah, they told me not to do that. OK, so this is the right terminal. And let me just uh, adjust it as well. Got it. So this one you see, right? Yay. OK, so I'm uh, using wget, and I'm just going to fetch a file from uh, the router IP um, from user wps uh, tools tool cache slash var slash RPM key dot rev. Oh, damn it. Uh, so I probably got a typo here. And yeah, so now I got the number eight. And I'm, uh, now I'm going to fetch the same file only with eight and pipe it through strings and grab something called all powerful login. And hopefully, I got a typo. Uh, uh, OK, got it. Powerful login. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to copy paste the hell out of it uh, with the right uh, number, which is 8. And this is it, finally. So those are the uh, admin credentials. I just fetch them unauthenticated, just like that. And now to finish my exploit, I will just log in to the SSH using the credentials I just fetched. And now I will enter the debug mode, script mode, and use exit command to run bin SSH. And as you can see, I got my busy box, and I am the admin, and I am part of the uh, root group. And this is it. Thank you. Whew. Wow, live demos are tough. OK. So um, let's understand what we just saw here. So I started by examining the web server configuration. Ruckus uses embed this as its web server uh, interface. And uh, this is how the configuration file uh, looks. 
we see that it uses slash web as its uh, web root directory. And we also see that it uses EGS handler for .egs and .jsp extension. EGS is embedded JavaScript backend language that the web server uses. But the most important thing is what we don't see here. We don't see any file fetching restriction. Whoops. That means I can fetch any file from slash web directory, regardless of its file extension or type. In other words, no access control whatsoever. Yeah, so now that I know I can fetch any file, I would like to look for some interesting file to fetch. There are 67 files that uh, are not standard web pages. Eight of them are symbolic links. And one in particular is this symbolic link to slash TMP dear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that means every file I will fetch from slash user slash WPS underscore tool underscore cache gonna fetch files from the TMP folder. Yeah, and since I was emulating the router using QMU system mode, I could run the system in its scripts, and I noticed that some files are written to slash TMP on system startup. One of them was this one, rpm.log. This log shows that every day the router writes a backup file called RPM key with a different reversion number, and that file looked like a really good file to fetch. The problem was that it writes it to slash var slash run. I can only fetch files from slash TMP. Well, it's not a problem, since uh, slash var slash, la, va, slash var slash run is also symbolically linked to slash temp slash var slash run. <laughs> Yay for me. Right, so now let's see how I was able to fetch this RPM key file. So yeah, slash user slash WPS tool cache is symbolically linked to TMP. Var run is symbolically linked, symbolically linked to TMP var run. Now I was needed to get the RPM key reversion number. Here it's 11. Well, uh, there's a file called RPM key.rev that just stored this number. So I first needed to send a request to get this number. And after that, I can just fetch the right RPM key file. OK, so now that I fetch this RPM key file, I notice that it contains some binary data. So I just uh, pipe it into strings. And as you can see here, these are the admin credentials in plain fucking text, right? Yeah. OK, great. So to finish my RCE, I wanted a busy box shell. SSH can be, en can be enabled from the web interface. But the thing is, Rockus are using their own CLI. At first, I tried to run a busybox with hidden command called exclamation mark v54 exclamation mark. And as you can see, it's supposed to exit the CLI and enter the operation system shell. But the problem was that it needed the device serial number, and I don't necessarily got this number. So I had to use a different approach. Eventually, I used the CLI debug script mode that uh, was only supposed to run store shell scripts. However, this exit command is vulnerable to pass traversal. So I just used it to run bin a sage, and I got a busybox shell as root. Awesome. So after this uh, beginner's level CTF vulnerability, it got me thinking. There are probably more vulnerability to discover here, and I was wondering in how many ways I can get code execution on those devices. So this is my second RC attack. Here I'm exploiting a Stack Overflow vulnerability with unauthenticated requests to an AJAC page. OK, but before that, I would like to talk about a Jira script I wrote that really helped with the reversing process. So Ruckus has left all their uh, log strings in the binary. As you can see here, we got debug, error, info, uh, warn, just about everything. And here we can see a Jira decompile code for a function, and it's debug log print. 
What's even better is that Ruckus also print the function name for every log print. So I wrote a script that just searched for this log print and renamed the unnamed function with the function from that log print. So here I just updated the name to get uh, zddn instead of the undefined function. And here we can see uh, a binary called emfd. I was able to reduce its undefined function from 1,500 to less than 900, which makes the reversing process way shorter. Based on that script, our team member Vera Mentz and I wrote a generic script for Jidra. Um, this script searched for patterns in Jidra, decompiled code, and renamed the function with uh, matches. Now I would like to show you how this script can work not only on Rocker's code. Here is a Jidra decompiled code for a dropper executable that was compiled with a trace option. Here we see that its log string contains a function name. Uh, this is buff get CD, uh, ecdsa prive keem. Our script uses uh, regex to match the log print and uh, group the function name. Then it replaces the function name with the group matches. So this is how we mapped, uh, this is how we managed to retrieve function name for dropper binary as well. Okay, uh, yeah, so this script is already available on Aleph GitHub account. Uh, feel free to use it. It's really useful for many projects. All right, but uh, back to my second attack. So now I would like to present three important binaries in the web interface. The first one is slash bin slash webs. This is the actual embedded web server. It handles HTTP requests and executes handlers according to the configuration we just saw. It then sends command through a Unix domain socket to EMFD. EMFD is an executable that contains the web interface logic. It maps function from the web pages to its own function. It then implements web uh, interface commands such as backup, um, network configuration, retrieve system information, and much more. Um, libemfd.so uh, is a library that's used by EMFD for web authentication, some sanitation, and some code execution. And um, now in a diagram, so um, web is listened to HTTP slash HTTPS. If it receives a JSA page, it uses EGS handler to pass function uh, to EMFD. EMFD then checks if the function name is mapped, and if so, he calls the function pointer. And eventually, EMFD runs some kind of shell command for example, if config, IP tables, route, route and et cetera. Um, I will get back to this later, but look at this carefully because this is where everything messed up. Okay, um, for example, when I'm sending an HTTP request to slash admin slash underscore update guest image name dot JSP, webs invoke the EGS handler. This handler uses a function called delegate which sends a command to EMFD through a domain uh, Unix socket. EMFD then maps every string it received to a function pointer and runs it. Here we see that uh, EGS handler uses upload verify string to, uh, to send to EMFD, and EMFD then maps this string to a function also called upload verify. All right. Um, next, let's talk about how the authentication mechanism works. So there are four permission levels, admin, user, FM, and guest. Here we see that each user has a page with a delegate uh, function call. For example, uh, FM login uses auth FM, and user login uh, uses auth user, and so on. Once a user is authenticated, his session is stored for a specific period of time. Each JSP page should check if the session is valid before calling other delegate function. Here we see that underscore cmd state uh, dot JSP uh, calls session check uh, before he calls the uh, ad, um, Ajax CMD state, and that means he checks for a valid session before he runs the Ajax CMD state. 
All right, so I used grep and got 67 pages that did not perform any kind of check. I then listed all the different functions that can be reached without authentication. And one function that looked very interesting was this AJAX uh, restricted CMD state. Um, here we can see that it does not perform the session check, and it can be reached by sending a request to slash tools slash underscore RCMD state dot JSP. But enough, about, uh, enough with the talk. Let's go to my second demo, which is the Stack Overflow exploitation. Um, right. Um, again, I'll just... Uh, use my um, terminal. Yeah, yeah, just, just, a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Live demos are tough, apparently. <laughs> OK, here am I. Yeah, OK, so now, everybody see? Yeah, awesome. So now, first, I would like to telnet my router on port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and see that uh, nothing works, which is good. And um, now, uh, this is my payload. So I'm, um, uh, this is my uh, overflow, and I'm going to call 10 at D with minus L and minus P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK, and now uh, let me just uh, uh, post this payload, and hopefully I will not have any typos. God help me. Uh, tools and underscore RCMD state dot JSP. Great. So, in a second, it should uh, work. Awesome. So I got a, a message OK, which is a great indication. And now I can just telnet my router on port 12345. And as you can see, I am the admin. And again, I am the uh, part of the group uh, root. Yeah, and this is it. Thank you. OK, so to understand how I was able to exploit this Stack Overflow, I would like to explain how the AJAX request works. I was able to run both Embed this web server and EMFD on the QMU system emulation. And that's how I was able to, ins to inspect a standard web request like that. Here I call the underscore, C, uh, underscore CMD state.jsp page which is mapped in EMFD to a function called AJAX CMD state. Makes sense. AJAX CMD state receive an action attribute from the request. Since the action is do command, it uses something called um, adapter command. Adapter do command then uh, calls a do command function. Do command is a large switch case function that executes different command based on the attribute it gets. Um, in this example, it gets a get connect status, which calls a function called cmd get internet status. Now, uh, let's look on a page that do not perform session check. emfd maps underscore rcmd state jsp to a function called ajax restricted cmd state. This is where the R stands for. The function also called uh, AJAX CMD state, but with a very limited set of commands. This specific request pass uh, zap D to do command, and it runs an executable called zap. This is how zap command runs in the shell. We see that we can control its server and client argument by passing the attribute server and client. The thing is, server and client are not sanitized good enough. So I can just pass unintended argument uh, to zap. For example, this minus D slash uh, temp slash B, crush me please. OK, so uh, I was able to find zap sources online. Ruckus described it as a robust network performance test tool. And when I examine the code, I notice there's a stack overflow in the minus D argument. 
here's the code that parses minus d argument. Uh, let's see what it does. So first, it replaces all commas character with spaces. Then it copies every segment to a temp buffer. Since it expects a number, this is a very small buffer. And um, well, they try to be secure by using, uh, by copying string with str n copy, but they use the entire string length for n. So it doesn't really protect the string in any way, and I was able to smash the stack. As for exploitation, R510 uh, uh, R uses both NX and ASLR. To overcome NX, I decided to use rope gadget. I used two gadgets to run system with a pointer to my payload. In this case, I'm using Telnet D that runs uh, slash bin slash sage as a login page on port 12345. As for ASLR, since ZAP is forked from EMFD, I can use a brute force approach and um, by that overcome its nine bit of randomness. Okay, so now I would like uh, to look at a request that runs zap command again. Um, so if I can control the server and the client attributes, why can I just uh, use it for command injection? So to understand this, I uh, need to understand how zap command is being executed. Here we can see that do command uses exec sys cmd implementation to run the zap uh, to run zap. Exec sys cmd implementation is a function in lib emf. This function first call find sys wrapper function. And then it uses vfork and execv to execute the shell command. Let's look uh, on find sys wrapper decompiled code. We see it uh, looks for slash bin slash sys wrapper underscore wrapper dot sh. If the script is available, it updates a global variable that I named sys wrapper path. Now, exec sys command implementation executes a slash bin slash sys wrapper, and in our case, it runs zap command with the argument from the adject request, such as server and client. Here we can see the sys wrapper dot sage line count, and it uh, seems like a very big script. But uh, it handles many commands, but what interesting me is the zap execution command. Here we see that slash bin slash zap is being executed with uh, opt variable. This variable receives both server and client values from the request. However, ops get its value with quotation mark, and that stops me from injecting code. And well, that made my life sucks for a while to be honest. But what kept me uh, entertained and motivated was that Ruckus had the weirdest CLI in their firmware. All right. Um, so before I continue to my uh, next attack, I would like to show you uh, other Ruckus CLI. So this is the CLI I had to escape for the first attack. This is an entire different CLI that also being used by the device. Uh, I noticed that it can be reached after system startup. This CLI uh, also got a hidden command, uh, exclamation mark, v54, exclamation mark, that also supposed to escape to BusyBox. But uh, it also needed the device serial number, and it was no good to me. However, uh, this v54 uh, command uses content from this file, uh, slash writable, slash etc, system uh, access. The content of the access file was written by another hidden command called ruckus. I discovered that by passing this string to ruckus command, I was able to inject code and escape the shell. But now for the, re for the weird stuff. When I called ruckus command to save my payload, this is what I got. And this one, and this one. Yeah, waff, waff, bow, bow, and rough. Yeah, Roku's CLI actually barks at me. Yeah, so 
when I call v54 to execute my command injection, I was asked, what the chow? As in chow chow dogs? What the actual fuck? No, seriously. <laughs> Um, well, at the end, I was able to run a BusyBox shell, and I didn't really care about those weird Easter eggs, but it was still pretty uh, entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, I still wanted uh, to achieve pre-off remote code execution by command injection, and I just knew that EMFD got to be vulnerable. It, it took me some time, but eventually I made this possible, and this is my last attack, where I found a command injection vulnerability, and I was able to reach it without authentication by writing a web page. All right, so as I mentioned before, EMFD executes code in a really messy way. EMFD sometimes uses libemf, other times called uh, shell script sys uh, wrapper, and sometimes it just runs the command itself with libc. These are all the different functions that EMFD uses to execute shellcode. Here we see that there are 107 libc system function call. So I had to find a page that uses this function call without sanitation. I was able to find four functions that call system without, uh, that call system and were vulnerable to command injection. And um, today I will be showing uh, the last one, which is CMD import AVP port. All right, so to reach the vulnerable function, I need to send an adject request to slash admin slash underscore CMD state dot JSP. And my request should look like this. I'm passing, the command, I'm passing a command with CMD equals import AVP port. This also uses do command to call cmd import avp port function. This function uses libc system function unsafely. Here we see uh, the function decompile code. All I had to do uh, is to pass uh, command injection in the upload file attribute, and as you can see, it just executes the code. Right, so this is it. That, that's a win. Well, not exactly. I still needed to be uh, authenticated to reach this function. Well, the problem was that uh, CMD state page check for session, and only then it calls the vulnerable function, Ajax CMD state. All right, so I need a different approach. And um, what if I could write a page that only calls Ajax CMD state and do not use the session check call. It might actually work. For this, I decided to use the zap executable again. Zap has a lot of different arguments, and we already know that we can pass unintended arguments to it without authentication. One of them is set a path for the zap's log. However, writing a log is not enough for me. I need to control the content. For this, I used tag, sub, and note argument. Uh, they are uh, a string, and just uh, so they get a string and just write it uh, in the log file for some extra information. Here is the log file writing code. It gets the file path directly from minus L. And I can control the log content by passing argument node, tag, and sub. OK, great. But there are more problems to solve here. I wanted to write a page, and it has to be in the slash web directory. The problem was that slash web is a part of the SquashFS file system, which is a read-only file system. I needed to find a writable path inside web directory. Luckily slash web slash uploaded directory is symbolically linked to slash writable slash etc slash airspider. And this directory is on a writable file system. Yay for me. OK, so now I knew that I can write a file with my content to the web directory. The only problem left to solve was that zap executable needed uh, to connect to something called TX station. Otherwise, it won't write anything to the log file. Since I got zap sources, I could just compile 
zap D, which is the TX station. And now I can set zap to connect to a station on my computer. Awesome. So uh, this was the request I needed to send. It executed this zap command. Notice that I used two arguments, minus s sub and minus t tag, to write my delegate call. Finally, Zap has wrote a file to slash web slash uploaded slash index.jsp. Although this, this page uh, was full of junk, that didn't bother me because what interested me was the delegate call to the vulnerable function. Now I can uh, chain those two vulnerabilities together. First, I write a page to slash web slash uploaded slash index.jsp. Now I can send a command injection payload to the page I just wrote. And this is the time for my last demo, which is the most difficult one, so good luck to me. OK, so uh, first I will need uh, another terminal. Yeah. This is it. And um, so uh, in this one, I will run uh, zapd, which is the TX station. And I will uh, listen to port 444 with netcat. Great. And now for my other terminal. OK, great. So now I would like uh, to show you the page create payload. So um, as you can see here, I'm using the uh, server and set it to my computer. And I'm using the minus L to write a page and minus T and minus S to write the delegate function call to Ajax CMD state. And uh, now I can just um, post it. Page create, this is it, to my router, uh, to slash tools, slash underscore rcmd state dot jsp. No typos. And uh, in a minute, it will just uh, reply and say, OK, awesome. So now I wrote a page. Next, I would like um, to uh, show you my uh, command injection payload. So here I am uh, using NC on the router. And with uh, netcat, I'm just connecting to my computer on port 444, 4444 uh, with a reverse shell. And again, I will post this uh, command injection to the router on uploaded slash index.jsp. Oh, yeah, shit. Sorry about that. OK, again, great. And now, uh, hopefully, uh, just a minute. Hopefully, I'll see that I am the root user. Hmm. One more second. Again. And now, be root. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Live, live demos. How about that? You don't. You don't see them anymore. Okay. Um, in conclusion. Uh, I demonstrated three pre-auth RCE today. The first one was credential leakage with um, CLI jailbreak. The second one, one was stack overflow without authentication. And the last one was command injection with authentication bypass. I also shared my Docker setup and introduced a very useful Jira script that helped with my research and can help others. Ruckus Networks was informed about these vulnerabilities. I requested 10 CVEs for this research, and they confirmed these uh, CVEs. If there are any Ruckus user here, you should stop what you're doing and go, go and check that you're running the latest firmware update. 
Um, if not, you may be victim to some very serious abuse. Uh, so again, please check your firmware ASAP. Okay, and um, well, this research was a lot of fun. Uh, it involved all sorts of different vulnerabilities. It was also an excellent opportunity to check our Docker emulation environment, which proved itself very useful. A blog post with all the details will be posted, but since Rockust asked really nicely, I will wait with my post until January 6. So stay tuned for my blog at Aleph Research Blog, and while you're there, check our amazing research. And this is it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for this great talk. So now we have quite a lot of time for Q&A. So uh, you already know the game. Queue up at the microphones um, or ask, the, uh, ask a question on the internet. We will today start with the internet. So please. All right. Uh, so there are a couple of questions here. The first question is, uh, will this work on unleashed firmware of Rutgers AP? Yes, it would definitely will. No, not the latest, but the entire research was uh, conducted on the unleashed version. All right. Um, now let's do an in-room question first. A microphone number one, please. Um, so thanks for the great talk first. Um, then you mentioned that there were 107 handlers for the, which called system at some point. Um, I hope you didn't check them manually. So my question would be, you probably used Jira to, to search for those. Um, right. How hard would it be? Uh, yeah, so the, the system, the reference count just gave me a really good indication that uh, they're doing something uh, wrong. Uh, and when I actually search for uh, command injection, I first look uh, what are the reachable pages that uses uh, system. So that narrowed the list to something uh, smaller. Uh, which was still around like uh, 15, 12, 15 or so. So I just saw so that the command injection was done uh, pretty much manually with Jidra. No uh, fancy scripts here. So n no analyzing of the call, of the call tree in, in Jidra? Uh, no. Okay. Thanks. Sure. All right. Microphone number two, please. Um, first of all, let me just express a what the actual fuck? <laughs> then, uh, secondly, from a networking consultant perspective, um, the quad one usage in your scripts, it's easy, but please don't do it because uh, people tend to use quad one as a legit IP address in their systems for dummy IP addresses, which is actually a DNS server on the public internet. Yeah. And, uh, just comment. Uh, the actual question is um, the all your attack uh, your attack vectors are against when you are able to reach the system on a layer three basis, right? Yeah, correct. So um, both of the all of the attacks are from both uh, the internet or the LAN, uh, but yeah, only layer three. So okay. And uh, in the end, I can uh, only offer you that I have some uh, hardware from an orange vendor I can offer you if you want to do some further exploration on other vendors. Yeah, why not? <laughs> All right. The internet has another question, I think, right? Right. Um, so the internet wants to know, uh, is the virtual smart zone mode also affected? Uh, no, only um, access point and some of the vulnerabilities, as I said, also work for the zone director. All right, number two, please. Uh, thanks again for the entertaining talk. And I noticed that on some of the slides, there was like a hard coded cross site request for Jerry token. So I just wanted to ask what's up with that and were you able to find more places where there are basically uh, security boundaries crossed by a hard-coded string like that? 
Um, yeah, so we found, so uh, I try to focus um, my research more on the, um, the low level and uh, like uh, stack overflow and, and command injection from the uh, binary analyze. But yeah, we saw some uh, web vulnerabilities. Uh, one of them is, uh, um, is, is SSRF and another might be uh, with the tokens that it's still hard coded. There are a lot of things to, uh, to keep on uh, looking in uh, those firmwares. So you didn't report that one? Uh, no, the, the hard coded one, not yet. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, the internet. Right. So how much time did you invest in total for ripping this device into little pieces in so many ways? Um, so um, it took me uh, one month. Uh, the first exploit I found, uh, I found relatively fast. I think it took me around two days. And after that, the, whole, the other analyze took me around uh, uh, three weeks or so. All right. Microphone number two. Thank you for this uh, awesome talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, the first uh, first uh, bit of the presentation was uh, a little bit fast for me, uh, the Docker part. Uh, how did you discover that you can uh, run the, uh, the Roxas uh, firmware in your own Docker container? Uh, can, you, can you please uh, uh, repeat your question? Uh, how did, did you discover that you can uh, run the Roxas uh, firmware in your own Docker container so mm. that you can discover all these uh, flaws? Yeah, um, so, um, so I skipped uh, a few steps. So I basically used uh, Binwalk and after I extracted, the, so I, I downloaded the firmware, used Binwalk, and then uh, Binwalk usually uh, extracts the SquashFS, which is the, the firmware uh, file system device, file system. Uh, so I just um, uh, copy it to my Docker, and because it's a cross-architecture Docker, um, it runs the ARM uh, architecture, and I was able to actually run the code from the firmware, the user space uh, code. Okay, thank you. Sure. All righty, any other questions? You have 30 seconds to invent a question. <laughs> Do you have 30 seconds of content? Uh, no, I can do a fancy dance or something like that. All right, yes, please. Okay. Do it, uh, yeah. No, no, I wish I could, I wish I could. <laughs> All right, still no questions? Um, well then, a good night to every one of you and thank our speaker again, please.